So this is calculation video two, and I'm going to talk about the business of calculation. Um, the most famous uh, start for players to have a reflection about how you calculate is a very famous book by <coughs> uh, Alexander Kotov, uh, who described, uh, who wrote a book called Think Like a Grandmaster, which was very exciting to those of us who weren't grandmasters. Perhaps if I think like this, I'll become a grandmaster. And uh, he gave a lecture about uh, this in uh, to some uh, Soviet players. Well, this is after he became a grandmaster, I think. And he asks, um, uh, and he tells the following story: uh, Do you know how to analyse variations? He asked his listeners, and without giving them time to reply, went on: I'll show you how to analyse variations. If I'm wrong, then stop me. Let's suppose at some point in your game you've got a choice between two moves: Rook D1 or Knight G5. Which should you play? You settle down comfortably in your chair and you start your analysis silently saying to yourself the possible moves. All right, I could play rook d1 and then he would probably play bishop b7 or he could take my a pawn, which is now undefended. What then? Do I like the look of the position then? You go one move further in your analysis and you pull a long face. The rook move no longer appeals to you. And then you look at the knight move. What if I go knight to g5? He can drive it away by h6. I go knight e4. He captures it with his bishop. I recapture and then he attacks my queen with his rook. That doesn't look very nice. So the knight move is no good. Let's have a look at the rook move again. If he plays knight uh, bishop b7, I can reply f3. But then what if he captures my a pawn? What must I play then? No, the rook move is no good. Go back to the knight move again. I must check the knight move again. So knight g5, h6, knight e4, bishop takes e4, queen takes e4, rook d4. No good. So I mustn't move the knight. Try the rook move again. Rook d1, queen takes a2. At this point, you glance at the clock. My goodness, already 30 minutes gone on thinking whether to move the rook or the knight. If it goes on like this, you'll really be in time trouble. And then suddenly you're struck by the happy idea. Why move the rook or the knight? What about bishop to b1? Now, without any more ado, without any analysis at all, you move the bishop. Just like that, with any, hardly any consideration at all. My words were interrupted by applause. The audience laughed so accurate was my picture of their trials and tribulations. Now, if that story rings a bell with you, and it really did with me, um, yeah, that, that might be the book for you. So Kotov says, um, you analyse drawing up a tree of analysis, and you do it like this. You draw up a list of candidate moves. In that previous example, that would be rook d1, knight g5, uh, uh, and, a, and a bishop move. So that's your, those are your list of candidates. You analyse each in turn once and once only. Don't do the between them. And then you choose the best move. All right? <laughs> what could be easier? So he, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's what he thinks. A bit of, a bit of discipline. Uh, this idea of candidate moves, I think, is really good. Um, so make a list of the moves that you need to think about and then have a think. And uh, a tree of analysis might look a bit like this. So actually, in his book, he gives a position and uh, and he says this is the analysis. So there's a yeah, rook takes f chick, uh, rook takes f6 check, uh, black recaptures, queen h5 check. And then there are one, two, three, four quick king moves that you need to analyse. And uh, so the king moves to e7, you check it, and then it can escape in three directions again, um, and and so on. So there's a, uh, th there's an analysis there of the different uh, uh, types of vision. And that's a, that's a, that's a real tree, uh, and uh, so that really can happen. Kotov also describes, which is a little bit more reassuring, not every position is like that. Um, sometimes you have a kind of a bare trunk. You start off uh, with a forcing move. And you can follow forcing moves all the way down one main line without much of a branch. Um, neither side gets much of a choice about their best moves, probably because you're delivering checks or something like it uh, to, to, the, uh, to the enemy king. You can have a position where there's a sort of a bare trunk, but with one big branch. <coughs> so you break through and then there's uh, maybe a... Uh, the king can dodge, run to the queen side, or it runs to the, the queen side, and but they, they're both fairly main lines as well. You can have what uh, you might call a coppice, which is a group of fairly long straight lines, or this this bush where uh, you just have to sit down and analyse each, and there are several branches to each line. And uh, so there are three lines that branch, and each branch may branch again. And that's the most complicated case where you do need this sort of uh, discipline perhaps that Kotov uh, talks about. So that was uh, that was a sort of a, 
big flag in the in the uh, uh, ground of this is how to analyse. <clears throat> um, I mean, when it came out, I think uh, club players like me got quite excited about it. But you, ask amongst grandmasters, and they're a bit less uh, a bit less impressed. They said, uh, so you know, uh, I, I think uh, I can't remember who the other other player was, but I think. Uh, John Spielman was uh, uh, asked about this at a at an event, and uh, you know, do, do you do you think like a tree? <laughs> he says, "I don't think like a tree." Uh, so it doesn't really reflect necessarily how grand grandmasters um, analyse. I mean, would they be better if they did? I don't know, but it doesn't seem to reflect the type of analysis that real uh, grandmasters do. I mean, I like the idea of candidate moves. I like the idea of a bit of discipline. But maybe it's uh, if you're going to try and do that. I mean, Kotov clearly did teach himself to analyse that this, and uh, and and was a very strong player. Made the candidates matches in uh, 1953. Made the candidates tournament in 1953 and played one of the most magnificent combinations uh, anyone's ever seen. So uh, anyhow, uh, uh, worked for him, but it might not work for everybody. So um, to to exercise uh, your calculation ability. Try solving positions uh, without moving the pieces, with writing down your solution, and positions that require some minutes thought. That's to say, it's not a sort of a calculation thing. Uh, sorry, a tactical thing where, you know, if you if you think you're going to get, you know, that oh, that's the solution and, and so on. It's not that sort of position, and also positions that you don't get all right, um, that you're actually at the at the edge of what you can do or get towards the edge of what you can do. You can get get somewhere, but you don't get it all right. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, perhaps spotting and treating some common errors. The first uh, tip, and I, I think is, uh, you know, quite a contradiction really to what Kotov recommends, is uh, think wide before you think deep. And this position, I think, is from Jeff Coakley, but it's a smart idea nonetheless. So... Um, if you start thinking about right, well, we've we've exposed the black king, and we can have a have a go at it. So uh, bishop g5 check is very uh, is very tempting to to play. Uh, we've sacrificed a piece. Actually, we've sacrificed two pieces to get to this position. Um, but no, bishop g5 check gets one back at least. Uh, takes the knight may have to come to knights uh, to uh, f6 to get. Uh, uh, anywhere we'll take that with check takes back with a pawn um, then then what can we do maybe that's not the right way maybe we um, I mean do we play queen h5 check and then bishop uh, bishop g5 anyway you can imagine that you can get quite some way down that line thinking about what happens after bishop g5 but think about your list of candidate moves what are the important things you need to think about first uh, what, are you, what do you need to think about here is your candidate moves. And I always say, look at every check and every capture. Every check that you've got here is queen g5 check, queen h4 check, bishop g5 check, and queen a3 check, which is mate. And so if you do think about all the ideas you need to start off with before going uh, too deeply down any of them, that's a good tip. So make sure your candidate, list, candidate move list is wide and that you try and make a little uh, stack of all the ideas in the position that you need before you start going too deep. I mean, ideas will occur to you while you're thinking, but you may be able to, uh, uh, to uh, you analyse better if you've got that stack of ideas to start with. This idea, also, this, this notion that you may come up with an idea that's relevant to a different line, um, that also rather contradicts Kosov's idea that you think uh, about each line once. Um, so this queen a3 idea may be, well, it's mate in this, this example, but in another example, it may be that it doesn't work to start with, but my goodness, it helps you with another line later. So think wide before you think deep. Uh, Cecil Purdy, I think, was uh, said that, a wise man. Uh, secondly, is, uh, is always give yourself a choice. Um, uh, Jakob Orgord is, uh, is good on this. He says, uh, if you're going to... Uh, Analyze a position. If you're going to, if you're going to make, just try and decide what to do. Well, actually make it a decision. Uh, give yourself a choice between the two moves. So here's a terrible move by Blacker. Um, has just been played from knight to c6 to d4. 
And what can we do about uh, that? Well, uh, I think Black was just anticipating putting some pressure on the F3 knight, maybe doubling our pawns. Oh dear, not the double pawns. And uh, was anticipating what actually happened in the game, which was knight takes, uh, knight on d4, bishop takes uh, e2, uh, queen takes e2, and then queen takes d4. And, uh, you know, that's about equal. And uh, Black should be happy with that. However, uh, happened in the game should not have happened in the game what should have happened in the game would be uh, knight takes d4 bishop takes e2 and then white has got a choice between knight takes e2 and queen takes e2 knight takes e2 of course saves the knight and wins a piece um, so if you do have a choice actually make uh, don't, don't make it don't just reply automatically uh, give yourself a choice of two moves in case one of them does, actually does turn out to be better and uh, and think uh, make uh, make each decision that you make a genuine decision. Um, here's an example uh, uh, which uh, uh, I, I've often used it to, to illustrate this point. Um, that if you've got a complicated position like this, this is a, from a, a bit of analysis that could have happened in a game of John Nunn's, and uh, this is the sort of thing where. The books will write, you get to this position uh, with white to move, and uh, quotes, black has got a winning attack. Um, oh, really? <laughs> uh, again, black's put in a couple of pieces to get to this position. I mean, clearly the king is, is perilously placed there. Um, doesn't it, does it have any moves? No, no moves at all. So if you can make a check without giving him a breathing space, then it's going to be made. So um, looks like a position worth uh, worth having. And uh, uh, and black's uh, sorry, white's got a bishop on b5 that's that's hanging, so that's a, an important thing. And how do you go about trying to assess a position like this? And uh, uh, Nunn and Griffiths, who in, who wrote about this game in their book uh, Secrets of Grandmaster Play, say just just start, just plunge in, um, just have a go. <laughs> and uh, and again, it may be that you don't need to solve every line all the way to the end. If you have a go at a couple of lines, you may learn a lot about the position quite quickly. So for example, um, if the bishop tries to save itself by moving to a4, for example, I think you've got mate in a few, starting with uh, uh, knight c5 check. Um, knight c5 check. Um, sorry, not... My apologies, knight to d2 check. So after bishop a4, knight d2 check, king c3, queen e3 check, king to b4, and then a5 mate. So you know uh, white can't save the piece, so you can get a, at least one piece back whenever you wish, still keeping the king exposed, which is rather nice. If you, um, if black wants to, sorry, if white wants to develop uh, their queen side, perhaps uh, by moving knight to c3, then knight c5 is mate. If they put anything on d2, you can take it with a discovered check, so you'll pick up a piece that way as well, With still with this bishop on b5 being uh, um, available. So that's that's nicely reassuring. And there's, you know, and, and Nunn and Griffiths give some other lines. But uh, I think that's the, uh, I think the, the point of it is that, that, you know, you, you know you can get at least a couple of pieces at least one piece back, you might get another piece back, the king's still exposed, this is probably worth a punt. This is also an example, um, I fear, of how uh, some of the older chess books have become um, less useful with respect, uh, uh, if they've not been computer checked. Um, I showed this to my machine just before doing, the, uh, doing this video, even though I did lose track of some of the analysis, and uh, the machine, uh, the, the dreaded machine says, if you look at this position and uh, show it to a machine, that the machine says knight to d4 equals. Um, so perhaps not a winning attack. Um, the point of knight to um, d4 being that uh, the knight moves with some of those discoveries, then knight takes uh, f5 <coughs> is uh, eliminates an attacking piece. So um, lots of other moves lose, but knight d4 seems to hold. Which is a which is a shame. Anyhow, but I think the point. I think the the, the position still serves to make the point 
The point being, if you just get stuck in a little bit, you might start to orient yourself in the position and you might find out a lot about it. After that, you can, all right, well, these two lines need, do need a bit more depth and we can go into those uh, in more detail, perhaps using some of the ideas we've seen already. Um, one of the uh, tips for analysis is elimination. Um, if you uh, rule out one of your lines because it's because uh, it's awful, then well, it's, it'll, it'll be the other one then. Um, unfortunately, in this position, uh, White didn't eliminate the one that was awful. Um, the threat uh, Black has sorry, the, the threat Black has got here is to play uh, a, a check on the. Um, E file, uh, rookie one check, uh, and after the king goes away, you nibble the pawn on f5. Um, so, uh, with with that as white's uh, threat, um, then as, as black's threat, white needs to do something important about it. Um, well, the, the thing that you could do about it is attack the g pawn. Um, if you attack uh, the g pawn from the uh, which might, might be the most natural move, rook to g8, then black can play uh, rook e1 check and then rook back to e7, protecting the g-pawn, but you're still going to lose your f-pawn. Um, so that one's out of the question. So whatever else you do, I mean, you, you can you can play rook, e, rook a7 without uh, without hesitation because you know that uh, rook g8 is, uh, is going to lose. In fact, rook g8 was played. Uh, so it's a bit of a failure of how to do that, but uh, nonetheless, if you can rule out one of your uh, one of your options, then you know the other one can be played without uh, without hesitation. The, the point being uh, uh, that obviously that uh, Black's not got an easy defence of their G pawn. Um, comparison is uh, another uh, another way to to play. Um, clearly, we've got two pieces hanging here: the bishop on G4 and the knight on c6 so uh, white can take on so black can take on c6 white would take on g4 and we could capture back on g4 perhaps with an extra pawn um, or we can use the bishop as a desperado perhaps by playing bishop takes f3 check knight takes f3 and then uh, uh, captures on c6 well so that's your choice can you compare them and decide which one's better well, after takes on c6, takes on g4, takes on g4, uh, we've got two pieces in play, um, and we've got uh, and we've got an extra pawn. So that's that's rather nice. Um, after bishop takes f3, check knight takes f3, king takes uh, c6. Then compared to the previous position, uh, we've still got two pieces in play, but white's got at least one piece in play. So on a straight comparison, that's going to be worse. And in fact, uh, in that position, white's got uh, white to move has got knight to e5 check, uh, followed by knight to knight takes uh, f7, forking uh, forking the rooks. I mean, even if you couldn't analyse that far, I think you didn't need to analyse that far to say uh, king takes c6 um, is the best first move because compared to the other line. Uh, we keep our massive advantage in development. We've got the only pieces that are developed. White doesn't have any threats. That's got, that's got to be the one, even if you miss the fact that there's a check and a fork coming up on, on F7, which is unfortunately what happened in the game. Um, some sort of bailout um, is possible. This is the extraordinary game between uh, Gary Kasparov and uh, Veselin uh, Topolov, where... Uh, White played, well, if you don't know what he played here, go away and look it up and enjoy the game and come back. But he played here the Queen's uh, Rook Sacrifice, Rook takes d4, and uh, and harassed the king until the end of the game and uh, uh, was uh, rightly famed as an extraordinary piece of imaginative attacking play, which it was and which Kasparov is very good at. However, I think there are several points Kasparov said, well, I, you know, I, I had a perpetual. If I couldn't see a way forward, um, I knew I could bail out and have a perpetual check. And I can remember having a chat with Andy Bourne, uh, Boyne about a, uh, a similar sacrifice he played in one of our local tournaments, which I've been unable to find. But it was a nice, uh, nice example of the same thing. You play, uh, you can play a sacrifice, but if you've got the um, perpetual check in hand, it doesn't. Uh, you're not, you're not actually risking that much. This is similar, actually, to Kotov's 
so queen sacrifice that he played in 53 in uh, Zurich where um, yeah there was there were several times when he could repeat the position and gain a bit of time and uh, before committing to go, to going forward so a bailout will help you commit to a commit to a sacrifice move orders um, very important so you can have all the ideas but if uh, once you've got them try them in different move orders to see what happens so for example um, we've got uh, two pieces attacking f2 for black we've got uh, two pieces defending f2 for white and it may be that uh, uh, the simple thing here is to play bishop to c5 with the idea of taking on f2 um, but uh, well, it's only so well and good we what actually happened was with black to move bishop to c5 and rather than defend white just played knight from d2 to f3 blocking the attack of the rook and uh, that was that was the end of that really there was very little way for black to enhance their attack on f2 i mean bishop c5 not a bad move but uh, nonetheless that wasn't as effective as it could be the most effective uh, way to play this uh, was to take on f2 immediately rook takes f2 uh, king can't recapture and if the queen recaptures uh, we've got bishop c5 pinning the uh, king, queen to the king so if you've got some ideas uh, try them in different orders or also try the most forcing moves um, the other thing is are you being a lawyer or are you being a scientist a lawyer argues for one side whereas a scientist tries to find out the truth and I came across this uh, uh, this example recently uh, from a young man of my acquaintance who um, saw an idea wanted to make it work convinced themselves that it worked and played it and the idea was well in this position you've got some sort of tension around the c5 point i think you can see two pieces atta uh, attacking it and you've got the c5 move and if black can be persuaded to take on c5 with the d-pawn then you've got d5 to d6 walking queen knight so c5 uh, presumably b takes knight takes uh, D takes and then you can play D6 forking Queen and Knight and that works and that's brilliant um, but uh, I think the thing to do just just sit down quietly to yourself and go let, let's have a look at that again so C5 black takes a pawn uh, white takes a pawn black takes a piece D6 Queen moves presumably uh, black takes a piece and then black takes a put sorry white takes a piece on on the e7 and then black takes a pawn if you add all that up um white's lost a pawn so although quotes the sacred you know the tactic quotes works and uh but you're not trying to convince yourself that it works you're trying to convince it so yourself it's the best move and your best move i'm pretty sure in this position is not to find a way to lose a pawn um so i mean other moves are available and, and i'm sure one of those is better so don't be a lawyer and argue for a, a move try and find the best move don't pick a move and prove it's best. try and prove it's best um another example of the same thing um i don't know if you want to stop the video and have a little think about this position for a while this was uh, uh from simon webb's uh how do chess players think um where he showed this to a, a position to a group of uh, English players different strengths recorded them for 10 minutes thinking about the position and said well what's going you know what's your what's your verdict and I think uh, well I mean complicated position from uh, Soviet championship Teshner against Stein this was um, from the 1960s and but Webb comments after listening to all these uh, people talk about the position he said uh, all the panelists seem to make a judgment about the position instantaneously and spend the rest of the time trying to find evidence to support this judgment clearly it's uh, very difficult to approach chess in a truly objective manner so much seems to be based on instinct but i'm, I'm sure that's true but that is something to get away from don't decide this position is winning for white and then try and win it um see what see whether it is winning for white and don't stop when you think you've found a winning line without checking it um I think probably the answer is if you did have a look at this the truth of the position is that uh, yeah this is a we know we've sacked a piece for an, uh, an attack the attack is strong um, but the attack can only be uh, pursued but it can be pursued advantageously 
with a knight sacrifice, either to h5 or f5, and I think both kind of quotes work, but uh, not uh, not easy, not uh, not easy. Another thing that can get in the way um, uh, is uh, is kind of what you know already, or what you think you know already. Um, I don't know if you want to think about what the best way forward for white is. Um, actually, it's a forced mate, and I wonder if you can find the the, the quickest and neatest forced mate here for for white. If uh, uh, if you're slick about this, I'm sure that you will have found uh, the uh, combination known as Philidor's legacy. Queen e6 check, king goes into the corner, otherwise it's mate on f7, uh, knight f6, so f knight f7 check, check, the king has to come out of the corner to g7 when there's a discovered check, you can play knight from f7 to h6, double check, King has to go back in the corner. Queen from e6 to g8. Check. Uh, rook takes the queen. And then knight to f7. Smothered mate. Very nice. Very neat. But not the best line. Not the shortest line at least. I mean, can't be better than mate, can it? But uh, if you play the queen check. Uh, king in the corner. Knight f7. Uh, check. King to uh, h. Uh, king to g8. Actually just knight takes rook. Discovered check. And it's mate next move, uh, which is one move shorter. Now, in this position, it's one move shorter. In another position, it might mean the difference between it working and not working. Um, so although you think you know what this is going on in this position, this is a particular instance of it, and something else might be going on. And uh, I found that quite a provocative um, provocative position. It's from a, a psychology experiment by a lad called Saraloma, who was uh, yeah trying to trying to see to what extent existing knowledge of chess players interfered with their their uh, successful solution of uh, positions. <coughs> Interesting. Uh, it's, uh, there are some other cases from Simon Webb's analysis where he found that, uh, again, it's, uh, there was one move in, in a position where only Grandmaster Jonathan Mestel and the worst player in the room uh, f uh, considered a particular example. The grandmaster because he knew when to break the rules and the worst player because he didn't know the rules and everybody else couldn't look at the right uh, couldn't look at this idea because that's not how you not sort of move you play in this position oh here it is so I've, I've forgotten i'd uh, included it uh, so here we go um the uh idea of meeting uh from black to flight with black to play f5 with uh, with g takes f5 and e4 was difficult to spot because that's not normally what you do and uh, the ungraded player uh, after f5 g5 was the obvious reply another really uh, strong technique which i've heard attributed to sham shankland but i think it's centuries older than him is uh, to say if you, there's a move that you want to play and, you, and it looks like it's not on well have another look and play see if you can play it anyway so black has just nibbled a pawn on a2 and uh, the proper punishment for this of course is to play b3 trapping the bishop king b2 and take the bishop um, now that doesn't work in this position because after b3 um, the c pawn is pinned so black can play sorry white can play uh, 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 sorry black can play bishop takes b3 so after b3 Black can just take the pawn with the bishop and you can't take back. Um, so that doesn't work. Um, but it does work. So b3, uh, bishop takes b3, and then knight a5, forking the uh, the rook and the bishop. So worth a second look. Even if you think it doesn't work, have a second look and see if you can make it work. Because if that's the move you want to play, that uh, that may be a way of finding the right move. Um, so play it anyway. Have a look. Uh, here's another one uh, where you might rule out the uh, the best move uh, or the move that you want to play. Um, I don't know what you want to play in this position. We've got some, shall we say, tension developing on g7. And uh, mate in one move is to pick up the queen on b3 and drop it on g7, checkmate. And to head towards g7 um, via, how would you go, queen from b3 to g3. And then take on g7 is uh, is going to be is going to be great. Um, while I've been saying all that, if once I mentioned queen to g3, you should have uh, thrown up your hands in horror 
and said, uh, but Dave, uh, Queen G3, we're going to get Knight E2 check and uh, we're going to lose the Queen. Well, uh, actually, yes, but the uh, the glorious thing about this position, in fact, is that uh, 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 Queen G3 check, Knight check takes Queen. Uh, this position is so good for white, in fact, that, uh, so that that we can still play this. Bishop takes g7 and rook to h1. And we're either checkmating or winning the queen or, or, or all three. So, in fact, queen g3 was played. Uh, another thing is, uh, uh, and I, I expect you do this already, but uh, try to make verbal summaries of how far you've got. Uh, with analysis, just to try and put down a little marker of of, of, of how far you've got is very uh, is very helpful. Uh, so uh, Tisdor says, talk to yourself, uh, not out loud, of course. That's against the rules, and ch uh, chess players have a shaky enough reputation already, which is a point I like. Um, but there's a uh, uh, and he gives an example of this, which is uh, nice from a player I can't remember who was playing, but. Uh, he gives an example of some uh, uh, reported analysis um, where clearly this internal dialogue of talking to yourself helped this player uh, get unstuck from a, from a particular type of uh, stuckness. And so only after he came up with this question uh, could he come up with a move that wasn't originally amongst his, uh, his candidate moves. Um, I rather like this example from um, just, just seeing it happening in in real time, as it were, between uh, uh, the old Master game shown on BBC TV, where Miles and Clark were playing, and uh, after the game they tried to give, get them to give a uh, uh, an account of what they were thinking during the game, during the during play. Um, so, if you'd like to play along, um, you're white. It's your go. What do you play? Well, uh, Miles' comment before the, he moved was to say uh, this, which I think is quite a nice uh, opportunity to eavesdrop on a Grandmaster. He's got to develop the Queen side. If he goes b6, extending bishop b7, I can play queen f3, game in time. If he plays to d7, I can play queen b3, which would pin his knight on b4 against the pawn on b7. And have some, some threats along the, long, the white, along the white diagonal against f7 and e6. Apart from that, I might be threatening to play taking on uh, bishop on g5 takes knight on f6. When he's forced to take um, the uh, with the pawn, since his bishop is needed to defend the other knight. This is after uh, queen b3. So what if I could find a waiting move? What about rook e3? And in some lines, that rook would be very useful on the third rank for an attack on the king side. So rook e3 played. However... <laughs> Hell, <laughs> I've allowed a knight from f6 to d5, and if bishop takes bishop, then knight takes rook attacking my queen. Oh dear, hell, maybe I can play knight takes knight on d5, and he recaptures with his knight, and then I can play rook to h3, and if he takes my bishop on g5 with his bishop, I can play queen h5, attacking f7 and uh, h7. Uh, it might be good enough. Still, it's too late now. We'll see. And uh, Clark, in his response, uh, this seems uh, very aggressive to me. He's going to play his rook to h3 and try to deal knockout on the king's side. He's only going to show me he's a grandmaster and knock me out straight away. I don't like knight from f6 to d5 because of the attack rook h3 followed by queen h5. I think I'd better develop on the queen's side and try to counter attack with rook c8. But I'm very unhappy about this position at the moment. So actually, rook e3 was played and uh, knight d5 wasn't played. And I think if you throw... Uh, this position at a computer it will confirm actually that <coughs> that that's uh, that attack is is uh, advantageous to white so the position is uh, so that was uh, still an okay move but I, I i sort of enjoyed the opportunity to say sort of eavesdrop on on miles's uh, thoughts there and indeed on clark's <coughs>